Hi everybody, this is Corey Christensen with the Journey Museum and Learning Center, and today I am going to be talking about the 1972 Black Hills Flood and the legacy that goes along with it. Um, the 72 flood, of course, if you watched the previous video, you know what happened that night. It was a tragic event that took over 200 lives in a span of about 12 hours. And now the Journey Museum and Learning Center is very excited to present the legacy of the flood. And so that is talking about the aftermath of the flood, immediate aftermath, and then ongoing reactions to the flood, what positives came out of it, because there were a lot of positives, and where Rapid City and the surrounding Black Hills area is at today. But first, we do need to talk about the aftermath of the flood itself. Um, facts about the flood are tragic. By all accounts, the 1972 Black Hills flood was the most tragic river flood in the United States. 770 permanent and 565 mobile homes were destroyed, 36 businesses were destroyed, and 5,000 vehicles were destroyed. And that is in Rapid City alone. Um, Keystone lost a lot of businesses and Nemo got a lot of damage as well. So in 2020 numbers, the amount of damage that was done was $1.12 billion worth. So in 1972, the number was about $165 million in damages. All of this includes the businesses, the homes, the cars, and then it includes infrastructure. So roads, the dam, the bridges, everything that got wiped out, everything that was ruined due to floodwaters are included in that number. And we do need to talk about the victims because this flood, like I said earlier, took over 200 lives. Many of these victims were located when they died near Rapid Creek or Canyon Lake. They were in essentially the wrong place at the wrong time is, is how we have come to understand what happened to the victims that night. 15 first responders lost their lives that night as well. And when I say first responders, I'm referring to the people who were trained in responding to disasters or were military trained. So that includes three firefighters, one reserve Rapid City police officer, seven U.S. Air Force airmen, and four National Guardsmen who lost their lives that night. The victims were of all ages, and even though there are five still missing bodies, those are included in the victim list, in the victim number, because most, if not all of the missing people have headstones identifying them. The victims of the flood can be found on the library website. They have a full list of victims with photos, obituaries, and other information attached to each victim name. Um, we are still missing photos of the victims. So the Journey Museum and Learning Center has been working on uh, collecting photos of the victims and there still are some missing. And you can look on the library website for that as well. So let's talk about the aftermath of the flood. This is going to be very interesting because there is a lot to talk about, but we're going to start with the leadership. So we have Mayor Don Barnett and the City Council. Um, they worked tirelessly to get Rapid City to bounce back from the disaster of the flood. In the following days, uh, they worked to get recovery efforts underway. And he, Don Barnett, if you ever get the chance to talk to him, He's a very humble man and very deserving of recognition for what he did during the flood, but he will also stress that it wasn't just him doing the job, and he's right. He did have 10 city council members working with him to get Rapid City to bounce back after the flood. And uh, he has told me multiple times that it wasn't 10 votes for these decisions that they made. It was 11 votes. So what he's saying there is that Don Barnett and the city council, they made unanimous decisions on what should happen in Rapid City for the recovery efforts to move forward. 
And one of the first major decisions that the city council made was to create a nonprofit organization called Rapid City Area Disaster Foundation, and they would take donated money from wherever the money came from and give it back to the community. By the end of the foundation, they raised over $1,360,000 in private donations. The nonprofit worked in a couple of ways. They gave back money to families who applied for it, and then they gave it back to businesses as well. And it was the goal of this money was to be utilized to recover from the flood. Uh, another leader we need to talk about is uh, Mrs. Medley. So Mrs. Medley, her husband died during the flood. He had gone out and her husband was a major of the Salvation Army. Um, he had gone out to find and help and, and whoever and however he could and he died in the process. Um, she actually didn't know um, he had died until the following day. Um, until actually late the following day that he had died, but she had had this feeling that he had died because um, in her report, she said that she would have um, heard from him at some point during the night had he survived. So she would continue working and giving assistance uh, via the Salvation Army in the aftermath of the flood until the middle of September. And then the last person we're going to touch on, and we talk more about um, what he did later, is Father O'Connell, Father William O'Connell. He uh, formed Catholic Family Services, which is now known as Catholic Social Services, and he formed the Rapid City Church Response to coordinate with flood aid and recovery. And these are just a snapshot of people that we could talk about. Of course, there was uh, the leaders of the Air Force, the National Guard, the PD, the Fire Department, all of these people who were being utilized in recovery operations, cleanup operations, um, right after the flood. Every single person could be considered a leader. So this is just a snapshot of what we could talk about. Organizational response is incredible. The amount of people who responded right after the flood is um, phenomenal. So, of course, the Salvation Army, we talked about Mrs. Medley. They sent in people to aid in the local response um, starting on June 11th when they could get into Rapid City and the surrounding area. They brought in more volunteers and organized response, as well as aiding in the organization of the memorial service that occurred. So they took care of flowers. They made sure that people were being recognized. Um, Salvation Army really kind of stepped up and helped with that process. The mortuaries, this is an interesting piece of information that I don't know if a lot of people do know, um, but they were obviously put to work immediately after the flood in taking care of the flood victims and their families. Um, different mortuaries, though, in Rapid City, they grouped together and created a nonprofit organization in order to get a loan to purchase enough coffins and to take care of other funeral needs for the victims of the flood. Now, just think about that for a second. They banded together, created a nonprofit, and borrowed money in order to buy the coffins that they needed for these flood victims. That response is incredible and not something that I had ever heard of before this. There were also uh, funeral directors from all over the nation that were sent to the Black Hills from different funeral homes to help in taking care of the victims, cleaning the bodies, taking care of the victims' families. Everything that a funeral director does, they helped with. Uh, Catholic Church Response, um, the organization worked hand in hand with other organizations to provide shelter and help recovery efforts in the area. And that's a very general, unspecific way to talk about what they did, but it was exactly that. It's how can we help? Can we provide shelter? Can we provide food and water? Can we help in some way? And they were given that opportunity. 
Lutheran Social Services, among other social service organizations, they were utilized after the flood for multiple types of families with multiple needs. Um, some families, of course, lost parents, some lost children. So Lutheran Social Services really kind of stepped up and helped these families get through what the next steps were. So um, there were offers of fostering children from all over the nation, who's the children who lost their parents, or um, talking about talking to the parents about their lost children. Those sorts of things is what Lutheran Social Services helped with. And then the American Red Cross, um, locally within the first two weeks after the flood, the American Red Cross had actually served 37,704 meals and provided shelter for 2,611 people. And that's with two shelters still open at the time of this report being written. So this is coming from an American Red Cross report that was presented. Uh, workers also combed the Black Hills area looking for disaster struck families and offering to help those who needed it. Um, the American Red Cross organization across the United States actually set out a call for donations for the Black Hills area for recovery. And we know that thanks to letters sent from governors across the nation to Governor Knight, who was the governor of South Dakota at the time of the flood. Um, specifically, I know that California, the American Red Cross in California, they set out a pretty high, I want to say about $2 million goal of to raise that much money for the Black Hills area. So these organizations, they all were very important and very, very invested in the recovery process that the Black Hills went through. City and county response. We are going to talk about a specific person for a little bit. His name is Chuck Childs. That is Chuck Childs uh, when he served in World War II. Um, he was a World War II veteran, and he was actually placed in charge of missing persons recovery efforts. Um, he worked for the county as a probation officer at the time of the flood. Um, he was situated in the courthouse, um, and Childs, along with his wife, his daughters, and other volunteers, there were seven in total, they would answer phones and help organize the missing persons list, help locate people in the process. Um, the number of the missing persons dropped drastically in the days following the flood. Of course, there was that initial confusion right after the flood, and uh, Chuck Childs helped in this process. After the first night, the list went from 4,000 to 2,000. By the third night, it was down to 600. And then by November, by the time that Mr. Childs had uh, written this report, he stated that he was sure that there were only five missing people left, and those are the five that are documented on the victim's list. Um, his report can be found in the blue book that we utilize, and um, it is a fascinating read to learn about how he functioned, how he had the missing persons process function, um, because there wasn't as much technology as there was today and so they really did work off of paper lists and and telephone calls and that sort of thing and then the other thing about the city and county response is that coordinated response was crucial um, within three days of the after the flood there was a coordination between the city the county and school officials that allowed the use of more buildings for shelters and recovery spaces. And this also allowed for the coordination of the volunteers who up until the three days after the flood had been helping, but not at a organized level. So to have that coordinated, organized ability really, really allowed the recovery to happen much quicker than if people were just going off willy nilly. Business response um, and community support. So in 1972, during this flood, 93% of Rapid City's power had actually been knocked out by the flood. Uh, within six days after the flood, power had been restor restored to the city of Rapid City. And MDU, of course, fought to restore utilities, which took a little bit longer, but that's because it was natural gas. And so they were working very hard around the clock to get these um, 
utilities back online. And here's the other thing is that while these workers were doing this, they also recovered bodies because in the areas that they worked ended up being a buildup of debris and a buildup of victims' bodies. So not only were these workers taking care of their actual jobs, but they were helping recovery in other ways as well. Um, other businesses around the Black Hills supported each other in the aftermath of the flood as well. Um, the hospitals, one hospital had completely shut down during the flood. Um, and so the other hospital received donations of food from grocery stores in order to feed the nurses and the patients and the doctors. And then other businesses donated clothing and necessities to different nonprofit organizations for the um, disbursement among victims of the flood. So there, it's just an incredible, incredible response that occurred. National and international response is interesting. Um, we know a lot of what I'm going to be telling you thanks to letters that were kept by Governor Knipe's office. They are located at the University of South Dakota in the library. The 1972 Black Hills flood made the news all over the world because of how incredibly quick and tragic the event occurred and then was completed. It was a perfect storm of, of rainfall, dam failure, we can go on. It happened and then it stopped happening very quickly. And so that is kind of that shock is what prompted this uh, uh, reaction all over the world. Uniquely, there was a huge outpouring of support from other states in America. Um, within days of the flood, Governor Knipe had actually sent letters out requesting support from all governors, including um, the governors of Puerto Rico, Guam, and other surrounding islands. Um, and within days of that, letters of support flooded in, all confirming that there was support and that a press release had been sent to newspapers in that state. Um, they, some of the letters stated that they could not guarantee support from their state, but they did put the effort forward to tell their state what happened and request support. The other thing that Governor Knipe's office did was it received letters filled with money. Um, and all of that money was transferred over to the Rapid City Area Disaster Foundation. So they did garner about $23,000 worth of support in that process. International support is very interesting as well. There's a lot of letters and telegrams that are that say, we're so sorry for your loss, we're praying for you. And I think even though monetary support in a recovery process is probably better, it's really nice to have that moral support that you could receive as well. Um, money was passed along from people from other countries. Uh, there was a woman in South America who by all, her own account is not very well off, um, but she would put money aside to donate to the recovery of disasters. And so she sent that money to the Black Hills um, when she could afford to. And all of this money again was transferred over to the Rapid City Area Disaster Foundation. Volunteerism, and I mentioned that earlier, but it, the amount of volunteers that were out in the Black Hills after the flood is most likely what made Rapid City and the Black Hills area bounce back so quickly. Volunteers did everything from recovery of bodies to debris cleanup to making meals, um, giving meals out, gathering water, gathering supplies. And we also find that volunteerism does not encompass just going out and doing something good. Every person who donated clothing, food, money, I think should be considered a volunteer because it is giving something. Um, and this is also a huge representation of the kindness within the community in the days and weeks after the flood. So what changed in Rapid City? Uh, this photo is a photo of um, 9th and Omaha. And what'll be interesting to see is what changed in Rapid City as I go forward here. So let's talk about, let's talk about it. Let's talk about Rapid City specifically now. 
So Storybook Island was decimated during the 1972 flood and it was moved to a new location after the flood. Um, it took years of recovery, um, but it was reopened and it is in the same place now as it has been since the flood. Uh, in fact, the flood, the flood all but decimated the beloved park. Pieces of Storybooks Island's figurines were found in other areas of Rapid City due to the movement of the water, including um, full figurines that would actually kind of scare people because they looked like bodies at first um, under debris. It was moved and recreated, and actually a lot of the original figures were recovered, restored, and put back on display after the flood as well. So the photo you see is actually a photo of um, what was Storybook Island right after the flood waters had receded. The green spaces of Rapid City. Rapid City is beautiful today. It has hundreds of acres of green space all along Rapid Creek, and that was created right after the flood. Um, Mr. Leonard Swanson, who was the city engineer and public works director during the 1972 flood, he stood up in a meeting in a city council meeting after the flood and that said that the city could not allow anyone else to sleep in a single night in the suicidal floodplain. And that's what he called it. This conversation started a plan to create green spaces where there used to be housing and where the victims of the flood lost their lives. And so that's why in Rapid City now there's that beautiful bike trail, Founders Park, Memorial Park, um, all of these different park areas. They are all along Rapid Creek and so it is a beauty amplification of Rapid City, but it's also a safety thing of Rapid City as well, because if there's parks, no one can live there. And then there's a national change that occurred after the flood, not directly after, but a couple of years later, and that's FEMA. Um, during the 1972 flood, the responding government entity was the Department of Housing and Urban Development, also known as HUD. Um, and, in, and then, in 1973, there was an act passed called the Flood Disaster Protection Act. And this act, of course, was directly influenced by the 72 flood that was pushed by McGovern. Um, very, 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 you know, actively. Um, and then in 1979, HUD became FEMA. And so in the executive order of the president, which was Jimmy Carter, there is a mention of the Flood Protection Act within that executive order. So essentially, they looked at what happened in Rapid City, took that information, and put it towards FEMA being formed. The other thing that has happened after the flood is the creation of what's called the Vision Fund. And we'll talk about the Vision Fund, but first we're going to talk about what the community in 1972 did. So in 1972, Rapid City voters first approved a one cent sales tax to pay for the building of the Rushmore Plaza Civic Center, which ended up opening later in the 1970s. So if we fast forward 20 years, voters then decided to continue to fund building projects in 1992, which is what created the Vision Fund. Um, a lot of the buildings around Rapid City, including the Journey Museum and Learning Center, were built as a result of the Vision Fund. Uh, the fund has allowed for the growth of um, outdoor activity spaces and the growth of arts and culture in Rapid City, making it an even better place to live. Um, so the Vision Fund started in 1992 Phase one was started in 1995, and some of the original projects that were funded were the Journey Museum and Learning Center and the Visitor Information Center here in Rapid City. Phase two, which occurred in 2000, um, that includes the Public Library and the Club for Boys. Phase three, which happened in 2005, includes the Dolphine Arts Center and Skyline Drive Preservation. And then phase four includes the reconstruction of Canyon Lake Dam, the construction of Main Street Square, and the airport terminal expansion. And that is a photo of Main Street Square um, from Black Hills and Badlands. So today there is 
a huge challenge that we are facing as a community, and that is that people are wanting to live in the floodplain. Um, this, of course, is a very dangerous thing um, because it is a hundred year it's a hundred year floodplain, and so that means that there's no real good um, prediction of when a flood would occur again. It's very unknown. And so to live in that floodplain and face that unknown is very dangerous. Um, which is why the Journey Museum and Learning Center and other community groups, including emergency management and the library and the um, city, they all talk about the 1972 flood and remember it and um, discuss it because knowledge is what allows the safety of the community. And it's also what allows um, or doesn't allow for people to live in the floodplain. Um, Rapid City, of course, it's unique in that it was shaped by this disaster. Um, and it, Rapid City and the Black Hills area had to adjust to a new normal quite quickly. And they did so successfully. Um, and that's because of the volunteerism, the leadership, the recovery efforts that were put forward and it's rapid city today is they remember the flood we remember the flood we talk about the flood but we're also we have also recovered physically recovered from this disaster that occurred in 1972. And that is thanks to, like I said, all the recovery efforts that were put forward. Um, if anyone has any questions about the flood, of course, the Journey Museum and Learning Center has um, these videos. We have information available. The library has information available. Um, and we're always willing to answer any questions you might have about the 1972 flood. Um, thanks for watching.